I want to start this segment with a with a clear statement, okay? And the statement is, and I hope this is uncontroversial, but um, look, if you hire on any criteria other than competency, you will get less competency. Right. As a statement, it yep. follows logically. Yep. It makes perfect sense. Per- perfectly logical statement. Now, park that for a minute, and we're, we're just going to watch a, a quick video. John, can we play the first video, uh, first minute of this video, please? Dozens of Boeing 737 MAX 9s are grounded this morning because of a terrifying mid-air incident. An entire section of the fuselage came off an Alaska Airlines jet as it left Portland, Oregon on Friday. Amazingly, no one was seriously hurt. Hundreds of flights, though, have been canceled, and it's raising obvious concerns about how could something like this happen. So Chris Van Cleve is at the Portland airport. This happen? Chris, good morning. And Marie, good morning. The plane is actually back behind us here. We understand from the NTSB when this piece blew out, it did so with so much force that it ripped open the locked, fortified cockpit door that was 26 rows away. It sucked off the headset of the first officer. It literally ripped the clothing off a passenger's back, ripped the shirt right off. That's how intense this, this uh, you know, depressurization was. Uh, we can also tell you the NTSB has learned that Thank, thanks, on John. three that, separate that, that, I think incidents... that sort of makes a point. So um, f- flight in the air, Boeing, Boeing plane up there, um, whole panel bloody comes off. Um, clothes are ripped from passengers. The the fortified door is ripped off its hinges. Um, one wow. woman was apparently desperately trying to hold on to her baby. This always happens. Yes. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm totally normal. I've never experienced an explosive decompression on an airplane, but I'd imagine it's it's not um, too much fun. But anyway, let's park that as well, because now we're going to have a talk about you know diversity, equity, and inclusion hiring. And just see if we think we think it matters in, in any way. So, um, I, I think probably one of the first times that we really noticed this coming up in a big way was was because Joe Biden, who decided a few years back that uh, he was gonna he was gonna hire a new Supreme Court justice, but he was only going to consider black women. Mm. Okay, so put that into context. Black women in the U.S. make up about seven percent of the population, and yet. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> but seven percent of the population—that's basically about the same as the population of Florida. All right. So it's it's, it's basically so because I don't, an I, entire state. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But nobody can sit through a single <laughs> theatre screen. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you're uh, taking. I, I'm trying to do this one desperately straight. Okay, but the, how the, funny would that be? <laughs> <laughs> that would be just a, like if you were to go for a for a, a proper good tourist adventure. The the state of only black women would be a hell of a tale. Dear God, this is not where I wanted this. This is not where I wanted to. This I, I should have done this as a monologue rather than two other people in the room. But look, but my point is, right? If you're trying to hire the best of somebody and you limit yourself to just seven percent of the population, yep. is it more or less likely that you're going to get the best candidate for the job by excluding ninety three percent of the population? You know, if if you're looking for the best Supreme Court right. justice and you looked only in Florida, have you excluded that seven percent of the population? Are they of the most competent, highest achievers, top scorers in their schools and their fields of work. Is that where okay, is that you're, what you're, we're excluding? You're, 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 you're jumping ahead. We here, are excluding Harry. the I'm, Chinese, because, yes. Because if we were excluding purely on the basis of competence, then yes. perhaps... Hello, Connor and Lewis Brackpool have recently spoke to me about why I should read C.S. Lewis, and we discuss his writing and his ideas. So whether you've read him or not, it's a good one to check out. So come on and sign up for the website. It's only five pounds a month. You can do that. So I, I think is I don't think I even need to to bring that argument into it as to whether certain demographics have their strengths more in I don't know performing arts, um, culture, and sports as opposed to law enforcement and constitutional analysis. I'm not I'm not even making that argument. I'm simply saying that if you limit the population that you are going to draw from, you get less competency. Right, that, that, that's all I'm saying. Yep. Um, in the end, Biden ended up hiring somebody. I think it was Shaniqua Brown Jackson, um, who I'm sure is a very competent lawyer. Although we did find out from her uh, confirmation hearings when she was asked to define a woman, um, you know, uh, apparently Senator Blackburn said, "Okay, can you provide a definition for the word woman?" Uh, Shaniqua said, um, "Can I provide a definition? No, I can't." 
The senator replied, you can't. And Shaniqua said, mm, not in this context. I'm not a biologist. So it, it gives you some clues the level of competency of this woman. You know, and it's very possible that, you know, she is a great Supreme Court justice, unless, of course, the case involves knowing what a woman is. Mm. And at that point, it sort of falls down. Um, and actually, on, on this one, I, I, I don't mind it, really, because it's quite funny watching her write her opinions so that Clarence Thomas can then rip them apart in his dissent. I don't even need to read any of those. I just need to mm. see the graphics that people do of words per justice in giving their opinions. And she writes yeah. thousands and thousands of words. She's writing an entire essay on it. Clarence Thomas writes about 200 words. And even in that, just dismantles the whole thing. Yes. Now, Clarence Thomas, I, I, it's worth mentioning him because he is somebody who, who, who does have melanin, but is also competent, mm. who, who was hired on the basis of competency. Um, and you can really tell the difference between those who are hired on uh, competency and those who are not. Let's have a look at uh, you know this post. So diversity, equity, inclusion has sort of been trending lately. I mean, I think you did a you did a segment on it in football yesterday, um, but it's it, it's it's currently a live topic. I I find this one interesting. So so Mark Cuban decided to take it upon himself to to basically do this little essay thread on why he thinks that diversity, equity, and inclusion is um, you know you know essential for a business. Um, Go on, let's have a look at the next. Yeah, so when pressed on it, he, he's basically saying that he thinks that the way diversity, equity, inclusion is that you've got your existing workforce, right? And then you've got this entire mass of talent that nobody is looking at. And diversity, equity, inclusion is basically just adding that extra vast resource of talent onto your existing body of, of resource. Empirically, this is as wrong as you could get. When discussing this, the whole yes. point of diversity, equity, and inclusion is to throw aside qualifications and necessity for competency. Well, it's actually like he's got oftentimes, it they will, oftentimes universities and other places will lower standardized score re uh, test requirements um, for particular ethnicities purely so they can get more of these through the door. This was one of the big problems with Harvard was the fact that if you were black, you had to have to get in much, much lower scores than if you were white or you were Asian. So that's a, fa that's a fabrication, well, complete fiction. M Mark is putting forward an argument that is so stupid that I don't think he's even capable of making that argument intellectually. Well, let's take the, the steel man approach to the diversity crowd here, because as you can see, Elon Musk there and then Mark's response, arguing, well, what if we have a hypothetical situation in which we have two candidates who are completely equal in terms of competence? Uh, but one's diverse, which means, I don't know, black woman, and one's not white man. And Elon says here, well, then the tiebreaker should be diversity of all kinds. And then Mark agrees with him. The thing is, firstly, that never actually happens, obviously. No one is the same. So there's completely difference in all human beings, pretty much. And even if you were in that hypothetical scenario, this still doesn't make any sense. Because if you say you want diversity of all kinds to be the tiebreaker, well, where do you limit that? I mean, well, I think, I think well, Elon is smuggling in ideological diversity on that one. Well, that's the thing. Well, why not just not, not race and sex, but then as Peterson points out, why not hair color? Why not eye color? Why not height? Yes. Like, you will just endlessly waste your time if you even give a step to this. Well, eventually you just get down to an individual, which is what we should have been hiring on in the first place. Yeah. And you've now wasted, what, about 10 years of America's time? Yes. Crap. And a lot of money. My, yeah, my reason for money. mentioning Mark in this context is because his argument is, like I say, it's so stupid, I don't believe that he is intellect... Because he, he's a smart guy. He's a billionaire. Uh, I don't believe that he's actually this stupid. I think that he is potentially being put on the reserve list to replace Biden. Well, as we see from the report from Bloomberg near the end of last year as well, when DEI is implemented most of the time, it's not going to be affecting the sorts of people in Mark Cuban's position if you say yes. that he is a billionaire. It's not going to be affecting most people within um, management positions mm -hmm. or anything above worker drones. It's going to be affecting those on the lowest rungs who are going to be the worker drones who are being priced out of any sort of jobs. If you're just working well, factory or manual labor, a lot of the time that is going to be they'll bring yeah. in black uh, applicants yes. and Hispanic applicants over white applicants. So that's who it's affecting. It, it, it's funny you say, how should it affect Mark? Because um, he's, of course, um, very much associated with the Dallas Mavericks. Now, let's have a quick look at their team, shall we? Um, uh, we 
Yeah, so that that these Dan was are, also a diversity hire. Yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm coming to that. So, so, so these are the the Dallas Mavericks. I'm I'm not seeing vast amounts of diversity. I mean, I'm, I don't, for a start, I don't see any Asian guys, let alone you know women mm. or Asian women. You know, this is this, this because it's all a lie. Yes. So it. So I'm I'm just going to ask the question: Is it possible? That when Mark selected his um, uh, Dallas Mavericks team, that they were hired on no other criteria than compet- competency at basketball. I think they probably were. I think I have to agree with you there. Yes, uh, I do know it gets slightly more diverse when you include the cheerleaders. So maybe that's what he meant. Because look, if you look at the middle of the front row, there's an Asian lass. So um, we we are getting a little bit more diversity. Dan focusing on hard <laughs> there. <laughs> So, 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 just but, scanning yes. through the image. Where is she? Where is she? Where is she? But, may, maybe when you start, you know, broadening out the organisation, you do get a little bit more diversity. But, uh, but yeah, I, I don't think. But anyway, my, my point with Mark Cuban is, it, it's so stupid. He can't. He cannot believe this. So I, I do think that he's possibly being lined up as a reserve candidate in case they need to get rid of Biden. I'm so bored of paid liars, though, and that's what he is if he's yeah smart enough. Well, you can't be on the Democrat platform and tell the truth. I mean, it's just incompatible. So yeah, I, I put a fifty. You, I put a fifty quid bet on Mark being the candidate this morning. Who would you rather hang out with, though? Like a genuine retard or a paid liar? Retard every time, right? Yes, yes. That's why we love yes. being on here with you. Yeah, I know. It's it's just way more. <laughs> Truthful. Yes. yes. You get a lot more colour in your conversation, ironically. Yeah. But but again, let me let me reiterate the central point. If you hire on any criteria other than competency, you will get less competency. You know, for example, if you are trying to find the best chess player in the United States and you only look in Montana, you might find the best chess player in the United States. Do we have to spell this out? But it's also you know, I think I think we do because okay, so let's move <laughs> Even on. Even I to, get this. Let, let, let's move on to <laughs> Even Callum. <laughs> Boeing. And he doesn't know what day it is. <laughs> <laughs> Boeing on um ha- on diversity, um, in inclusion, and equity, or whatever it is. So uh, a quick seg- a segment from from the Boeing's uh, CEO message on this. Uh, I, I quote: "We prioritize diversity, inclusion, as measurable business imperatives that are vital to achieving better business outcomes." Okay, obvious lie. So, I mean, <clears throat> again, I'm going to ask the question here. You know, what happens to the incentive of recruitment managers in an organization organization like this? Because you know, have any recruitment managers been told that their job depends on upping the amount of dye in the organization? Yeah, I would imagine it has happened. I mean, anecdotally, I've heard of that. I've heard not of just recruit- that their job is dependent on it; that they will get financial bonuses if they hire yes. more people of diverse backgrounds. Yes, so it's logically true. It's anecdotally true. Everybody who knows somebody who is a recruitment manager knows that they have been told you must up your die. And worse than that, we know from experience that companies, when they can't reach their die percentages, even after that sort of finagling, they then lower the standards. Yes. Yes. Well, and even if they don't lower the standards, I mean, I'll just pose the question: Is it possible that if you're told that your bonus or your job depends on you increasing the amount of die, is it possible that you would take a candidate who falls below the competency line and push them through? Oh, they absolutely do. The, mm. the, the funny thing is, when we're talking about the competency, it's not just that people are not hitting the standards expected them from, say, standardized tests. People's standards are being so lowered. I think it was possibly in Alabama last year after one of the police brutality scandals, of course, uh, where people looked into it and found that some Alabama police stations were actually removing requirements for police officers who were trying to apply for not having been a former convict. So former convicts, it's not just in terms of the intelligence that you're looking for, it's in the temperament, the behavioral standards. All the standards disappear. Just thrown out of the window. If If you're telling me that somebody who has previously been a convict is nine times out of ten going to be more competent at administering the law than somebody who hasn't been, yes. then I don't believe you. I think you're lying. Well, and, and just turn the question around. Would you want to give a, a proven lawbreaker a badge? Because that, that makes it a lot easier Would to... Would you like to give him a gun? Yes. Well, I'd imagine he's already got one. How about an aircraft with 300 souls on board? Mm. Well, yes, that, that, that's another angle to this as well. Um, so coming back to coming back to Boeing and that and that panel blowing off. Um, look, 
we don't know exactly what happened on that. You know, the, 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 the looking into hasn't been done. It is entirely possible that only boring men in their 50s were involved in assembling that particular aircraft. That could be the case. They just got a bit sleepy on the yeah. job. Well, no, it, it, that that could legitimately be, be the case. And it's no, also agree. it's also possible um, that the entire team who put that aircraft together were diverse, but they were genuinely competent. They had passed the competency threshold to get onto it. What I'm saying is, is I'll keep saying this, if you select on any criteria than other than competency, you will get less competency. And therefore, it is legitimate to ask if, if competency is being pushed down in this organization, what impact does it have? now? At this point, I want to turn to an excellent substack <clears throat> from our friend uh, Morgoth, um, who, who I don't believe he has been on the pod yet. We'd, we'd like to get him on, but um, but uh, he he has an excellent subset. So stick at, check out um, Morgoth.substack.com, and and he's basically laid out the whole thing here, um, which is which is very helpful because because he basically did a lot of my work for me. Um, and, and as very you kind of him, as, as you correctly note, Harry, I, I am a diversity hire myself. Um, that was Callum, actually. So, oh right, even yes. then, yes. Um, well, because no I'm, attention span. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a desperately good podcaster, but Carl just wanted another Gen Xer in the office because he was fed up of making cultural references that nobody understood. So, um, you know, rather than having the most competent podcaster, you've got me. And um, <clears throat> anyway, so let's have a look at what uh, what what argument. He, oh yes, so so Morgoth. Has has pulled out some very helpful bits from um, the the Boeing um, literature, um, such as uh, yes, such as this. Boeing continued to make progress on our commitment to advance representation inclusion across our company. We know diversity must be at the table for every important our decision we make, every challenge we face, every innovation we design. Equity, diversity, inclusion are core values because they make Boeing and each of us individually better. So. Um, Interesting. It's not. It's not competency. It's not making aircrafts that hold together mid-flight. The, the the core competency is is diversity. But everybody who who dies in a plane crash that happens because of these sorts of things will die knowing that they died in service of a better society, in service of a better future. They can die yes. knowing that their soul, as well as their culture, has been enriched. Well, I mean, I I, I have questions on that. So Morgoth also found this. Um, so this is um, Jada West, who was saying, I was encouraged, and she's, she's a Boeing hire, mm -hmm. I was encouraged to push my boundaries and take opportunities outside of my comfort zone. Um, now you say that, Harry, but... Um, oh, from the inaugural Thurgood Marshall College Fund, everybody's, everybody's favorite former Supreme Court justice. Look, even if, even if you're you know, Jada's brother or sister or close family member, when you put, when when they get on an airplane, I wonder: Do they want that airplane to be made by people who were hired purely on competency inside their comfort zone, or do they want to be sat on an aircraft that was made by people who were hired for reasons other than competency, who were operating outside of their comfort zone? I think even Jaden's brother and sister would agree that they probably want the latter. You know, this is this is this is not a race space point. I think, you know, no matter what you are, black, white, Hispanic, North Italian, cave Jew, Mongolian, Mormon, whatever you are, you want to sit on a plane that has been well made, right? Break down a Boeing staff. I like the idea of someone having a breakdown. Wait, this plane was put together by Mormons? <laughs> oh God, get me off. <laughs> uh, new new hires at Boeing. Um, because of the, so they got they got a whole racial breakdown of of, of who works at Boeing um, by now, ethnicity. You, you notice the higher up the organisation you go, the whiter it gets. Um, but they are correcting that with their new hires. So their new hires are a forty seven and a half percent. The funny thing I find is that when racial you, minorities, when you see that the board of directors is twenty five percent as opposed to sixteen point seven percent minority now. Yeah. Oftentimes, you'll get statements after these people leave these positions where they speak to um, magazines and journals and such, and they say, yeah, I was definitely just there for the photographs. I would put ideas forward and nobody would listen to them. Yeah. So I, I, was, I was working in the city when the, the sort of proto-die came along, which was, which was at the time in the, in the sort of early 2000s. It was, let's get women on boards. 
Um, that's what it was back then. So, so that you can pad yeah. the statistics and you can have them front and center in all of the promotional. Material. And and basically what happened is because there was only, because a lot of women, they leave the workforce because they have other priorities. They want to focus on family. They make that choice themselves. They want to focus on family. But you still do get a few women who rise to the top in organizations, big companies who started their own. But there's there's relatively few of them. And so what I was seeing in the city when in, in the early sort of 2000s was there was a cadre of about 20 or 30 50 year old women who had the right experience who would be on like 60 70 boards each and and their entire job would be to do one day a month or half a day a month with various businesses and they just go from board and that's all they did just go from board meeting to board meeting and how did that pay oh e- each board job well back then would have paid about 12 grand a year so basically 1000 pounds a month but if you got if you got 50 of them well, yeah, that's the yeah. thing, isn't it? It's 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 good living. So, yeah, I've I've, I've sort of seen this seen this one emerge themselves. But my my point of looking at this is, you know, America is still sixty two percent white, um, and Boeing's new hires are only fifty two percent white. So they they're already doing the exclusion bit of DEI, and have been for some time. By the yes, way, the measurements there. Yes. Now, now for the fedora tippers who get really into the into the detail, I, I, Morgoth did pick out that the, the particular panel bit in this aircraft apparently a large part of that was outsourced to something called um um spirit um spirit something uh, yes yeah, spirit so aero systems that's the one so so morgan writes um in in um in the 737 model fuselage that lost a panel mid-flight was a company called spirit aero systems based in canvas ah yes clever boeing is merely paying lip service to the woke agenda while outsourcing actual engineering to boring white men in their 50s that spirit. So um, I'm reminded of those images of that submarine from last year. Yes. Say hello to our team. Yes. Yes. Um, and it's not just the aircraft design itself. You know this this because you know when when this is a you know a tweet from somebody pointing out that um, United Airlines wants to make half of its um, pilots um, women or people of color. So basically, they 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 want to take. Um, you know, they, they, they want to force this through the, the person actually flying, ha- having to land the plane that's falling apart as well. Now, this is not to say that women or people of color can't be very competent pilots. I'm saying that if you are forcing through a, an arbitrary mandate to increase the number, you're going to have to push some people through who wouldn't have made the line otherwise. Well, what, what you're doing is you're arbitrarily limiting the potential candidates that you yes. can hire from. And so you will by virtue of doing that, be reducing the number of competent people that you could be hiring. Yes. And you will be potentially, yeah. once again, as we pointed out, as always happens, lowering the standards to accommodate for getting these people in. Well, normally, mm. normally we have this particular standard and we need to hire 10 people. But only five people within this candidate pool hit this standard. So therefore, we're going to have to bring it down just mm. a bit so we can justify hiring another five of you out of this Yes. Pool. Yeah, and you, and you can see why people are talking increasingly about a competency crisis because, you know, we, frankly, I didn't care when it was in the academics. I, I didn't even particularly care that much when it was in the Supreme Court. But when it's the people making and flying my aircraft, I think I care. When it begins to affect things that you interact with on a daily basis, then, yes, yes, all of a sudden the ability to maintain and operate complex yes. systems becomes very <laughs> important. <laughs> yes, you, you might possibly have a segment coming up in, in a few moments about the ability to maintain complex systems in the inability in, in, in certain countries. So that's the truth. There's a uh, weird um, schadenfreude to this for the Russians because I met a guy in Russia whose grandfather lived during the Soviet Union. And Soviet universities operated on a system of affirmative action. So they would uh, hire people based on their ethnic group. And this was against the Russian majority, he was telling me, which you know, is really weird, but obviously is exactly the same world the Americans now live in. And now in the 90s and then to today, that system got dropped because the Soviet Union collapsed. And this dude was telling me all this. And he was just laughing when I told him about what goes on in the US like this. He was like, how did you guys end up copying Soviet theory that even we got rid of? <laughs> because it didn't bloody work. Yeah. Like, yes. Our, our crack team of producers have just dropped another link in. Um, this is a, this is a tweet from Ashley St. Saint Clair. So I'm, I'm reading this for the first time. Um, on July 29th, the United plane was nearly totaled after a hard landing. Who was flying that aircraft? The co-pilot was a former flight attendant who was fired and then rehired through United's DEI program despite being on the list to not return to United. 
Whoop, whoop, so, wait, wait. Not only did they get fired for incompetence, but they got a bump from flight attendant to co-pilot. Amazing. Okay. Um, am I correct in thinking this individual failed multiple trainings, including a simulator training? Am I we, also? We, we just need to bump up the statistics. So who cares? Who cares? We need them. Get them through the door. Am I also correct? United has covered up this DEI disaster and many others. Yeah. So I mean, another question about Mark Cuban. I haven't checked, but do Are you think you dumb? Do, do you think Mark Cuban's because I'm pretty sure he's got a personal jet. Do you think his personal jet is is flying by a, a diversity liner? <laughs> <laughs> Live your values, bro. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, final final thoughts on the coming uh, competency crisis because there were there were further implications from it. Scott Adams here makes a really good point. Um, recommended question for all white male job applicants to ask a, when you're in an interview. Do you have a DEI group in this company? If so, how can I be sure I would have equal opportunity for advancement here? Now, the reason this is an important point is if you are a competent white male and you're thinking of going into something like Boeing. Now, Boeing is one of those, I mean, some jobs people move around a lot. Engineering jobs, people tend to work there for bloody decades when, once they get in. If you're a competent young engineer who happens to be a white male, why would you go and work at Boeing knowing that your, advance, your, your prospects for advancement are clearly limited because the organization is telling you very clearly they want to get the group that you are in down to the smallest level of representation that they can? For the exact same reason that people who are black in the United States would go and work for companies that were explicitly anti-black back in the day. You've got a choice. Well, some people won't have a choice, but a lot of people will say, okay, I'm going to look at something different. I'm going to go and set up my own thing. I'm going to go and work for a smaller engineering firm. Just start your own airline. Well, not. I mean, there are plenty of other engineering firms that you can go and work for. Don't get me wrong, they exist, yeah. but it's, it's just not the industry, is it? No, but what I'm saying is at the margin, you are going to have people who, I mean, there will be some people who are absolutely committed to doing avionics. And there are some people who could have gone into it who would have been competent and will instead see stuff like this and decide to go elsewhere. And that will, that will start to feed back on this competency mechanism. So not only are the people they're bringing in less competent, but they won't be able to hire the competent people if they happen to be white, which happens to be the majority population of the US. And therefore, this competency crisis is probably only getting started. If you appreciated that episode from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that's on the site, such as the book club series, this one on when kids say they're trans. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Twitter at lotuseaters underscore com on Twitter. Thank you and goodbye.